Hello, everyone. My name's Beth Wilson, and I'll be the MC for the, this consumer webinar on intimacy and continence with the cheeky little subtitle, What to Do When Incontinence <laughs> Joins You in the Bedroom. First, however, I'd like to do the traditional acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. We have a panel of experts to assist us tonight. Thank you, there we are in all our glory. Um, I'm the patron of the Continents Foundation of Australia and a person with lived experience and I was previously the Health Services Commissioner in Victoria. Alan, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, thanks, Beth. So I'm a consumer representative and prostate cancer survivor and run a prostate cancer support group here in Melbourne and the group's been operating for over 10 years. Anya? Hi, my name's Anya Christopherson. I also have lived experience of incontinence. I was born with a congenital condition which required a reconstruction, so I've been incontinent in my bowel my entire life. And Elise? Hi, everyone. I'm Elise Wald, and I'm a clinical psychologist and director of clinical services at the Ken Miller Institute. And Gay? Hi. My name is Gay Corbett and I'm a prostate cancer nurse at Ballarat Health Services and I look after men and their partners as they navigate their way through prostate cancer and its diagnosis and the survivorship of it. And George Turner. Hi, my name is George and I'm a clinical social worker and certified sex therapist. Thank you. Now for our participants, um, please remember there will be a live Q&A at the conclusion of the presentation. So please send in any questions that you may have around the specific topics being discussed tonight for our experts to address. Now, these are the topics that we'll be discussing. There's quite a lot of them for a one hour webinar. So the answers, um, we'll try to keep them concise and relevant. Uh, and please send in your questions any points of clarification that you would like. We'll begin with challenges with intimacy. Now, um, would you like to have the privilege of opening that topic for us, Anya? Yes, absolutely. I think that it's a really challenging topic because it's not spoken about as much. And I think that if there was more understanding and awareness of things like incontinence, it wouldn't be as challenging as it is. Um, I think, of course, when you're in an intimate setting, there's nothing really to hide. And that is often when you cannot hide your incontinence. So I think that you really have to have that emotional intimacy with your partner. So you, if something bad happens, like an accident, you're able to explain it. And Alan? Well, intimacy <clears throat> often involves being up close and personal with your partner. And unfortunately, following prostate cancer, men are incontinent overnight, and some men, of course, will be continent within a couple of weeks, but it's more the norm that you will be incontinent for some months. So often experiencing that and dealing it with not only just going to the toilet, but when you're wanting to be intimate and being sexual, you can start leaking. So that can really do men's heads in, and being able to address that, know what to do about that can make a big difference to maintain that intimacy and that closeness in the relationship. So, Gay, this um, segues nicely into the work that you do. What would your comments be? Well, as a health professional, it's not something that people want to come up and talk about. Oh, look, my intimacy, I, I need to have a chat about the fact that I'm not functioning that well in the bedroom, I'm wet, and I don't know how to talk about this. It's something that I've found as a prostate cancer nurse, um, it takes time to establish a relationship with, with the, the men and partners that I'm dealing with. But it's a topic that once I open the door, a lot of people want to talk about. So um, my experience has been that I've been overwhelmed with a lot of people out there that didn't know where to go to talk about intimacy and certainly intimacy and, and erectile dysfunction and incontinence. Thank you. Yes. And over to you, Elise. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think there's challenges with intimacy in general that a lot of people have. You know, we tend to get so caught up in our heads when we're trying to be intimate with somebody and 
so focused on anything that we think is actually not okay. So when we have something in addition, such as incontinence, it can really affect our sense of self and self-esteem and our ability to communicate when we're in intimate situations. Great. And also, I think, if I could just jump in there, sure. is that mm -hmm. lack of control that men experience mm. uh, being incontinent over not, not only having to deal with pads, but now they want to be in a relationship, in a sexual relationship, and all of a sudden they're leaking. So mm. it's another whole hurdle they have to deal with, not only have to go to the toilet numerous times and have pads, but now how do I control that when I want to be intimate with my partner? So it is a difficult one. Mm. Yeah. And if it's a new relationship... Mm. You know, even more so because you're so self-conscious to begin with in that new relationship that it almost gets in the way of being able to have that discussion and talking about something in a very natural way. And George, would you like to explain to us what you do in a very natural way? <laughs> sure, absolutely. I think um, people have um, stated a variety of great advice and suggestions. But I think the number one thing is to remember when you're with a sexual partner, it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a playtime. Mm. And oftentimes, as someone has said, people can get in their heads and that's probably the worst thing you can do during a physically intimate encounter. You want it to be enjoyable. And so remembering that you have both physical intimacy and emotional intimacy, mm. which is the idea of, you know, getting um, the, the, the willingness to be known, the, the taking risks and being vulnerable. Those are the elements that really can um, enhance that encounter, that time together. Thank you, George. Um, our second heading is impact on body image and emotions. So, Alan, would you like to begin with that one? Well, I guess there's a few things that impact on men again. It's the emotional impact of incontinence straight away that, oh, my God, I'm going to be intimate with my partner, but I'm leaking at the same time. So there's, I think, for men would be a lack of control, certainly for me, being a prostate cancer survivor, was that lack of control. You think you can control this body function, but it just doesn't happen. And unfortunately, in the early stages, uh, after surgery, when you are being able to be intimate, one of the first things that happen, you'll start to leak as you have an orgasm, and that's even a double impact. So there's a certain impact, I think, on the body image that I can't control my body, and now I've got this emotional impact. So it's a really big hurdle, and that's where it's important for the relationship and for men to discuss this with their partner rather than just putting aside. Of course, you're going to be embarrassed. You're a human being, you've got emotions. But if you can talk that out and uh, use some little tricks to get you through that, that particular period of time, then that becomes a lesser concern. But you've got to address it. It won't go away at the same time. Thank you, Alan. Um, Anya, what are your thoughts? I definitely can echo everything that Alan said. I think it's incredibly scary when you don't have control of your body and necessarily like in these situations, intimate situations, you don't always have control of the situation as you're really going with the flow with your partner. I think especially as I can really speak as a young woman, there's a lot of pressure um, for sex, I think, to be this perfect magical thing. Oh. And being incontinent, it takes away from that because you don't feel like it fits into the box that it's supposed to fit in. But I think it's all about building your own body image and your own confidence by realising that something that you cannot control is not something that you should be judged by or judged on. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add anything there? I think I just want to jump in yeah. and I think that's a great segue to say, you know, I don't think anybody has perfect sex. And the reality is, oh, I think okay. we're, all oh, holding I our, <laughs> we're, we're holding ourselves up to this standard yeah. that yeah. just doesn't yeah. exist. And it's it's part of this ideal that everything's supposed to line up, everything's yeah. supposed to lead to orgasm, everything's everybody's supposed to have a perfect body, everyone lives in this Hollywood fantasy, and that's what it is. It's a fantasy. Yeah. And so I think if we can just provide ourselves a little bit of grace to be imperfect, that's the first step. Yep. Okay. And would you like to engage in a little bit of fantasy for us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I think that uh, what, what's really interesting with our, our body image, we know from the research into this area that actually that's the very first thing that tends to get affected, a sense of self-esteem. Um, we know that, that a lot of people feel really embarrassed. And yet if you really take it out of, put it into context, when you're with somebody 
And you're not really noticing the imperfections when you're in an intimate sexual play. You're actually just loving that person or enjoying being in that environment, whatever that might be. So it is kind of really that idea of learning how to coach yourself through that process and allowing yourself to realize you would never reject somebody because of an imperfection when you're actually having a relationship with someone. It's about connecting on a, a very different level and acceptance of self and others. Yeah. Thank you. They say love conquers all, so um, <laughs> perhaps love forgives as well. What do you think, Gay? Well, I think um, in, in the men that I see and, and the partners, the, the body image takes quite an assault. We've mm. got um, men that have been functioning quite well before they've had surgery, they can get erections, they're continent with their urine, and then there is this, I, my life or my body was perfect before mm. and um, in comparison to what it is now. So the, I always liken it to quite an assault on someone's mm. self-image and, and quite paralysing on emotions and, mm. and being able to move forward. Um, and so it's about... Um, recognising maybe goalposts have changed. There is, a, there is a, a difference in how things will be performed and, and I say it's a really good challenge for, mm. for couples that have been doing the same old thing, yep. the lights off in missionary <laughs> position and it worked and everyone was happy and all yeah. of a sudden now we can throw it all up in the air and we can try different things. But the mm. very first thing is building that trust back, the trust mm. to actually talk about the challenge to body image, the trust to talk about what you want in terms of intimacy. Is it actually penetrative sex? Is it holding hands? Mm. Is it a massage together? What is the thing that you want as your intimacy in your starting place? And just work together if possible mm. on that and and talk about your, your um, impact on your body image and how it's making you mm. feel. And that's a good start. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with... Um, what the guy is saying also, yeah. I call it wounding of the soul for the men particularly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's important that the relationship now has something to work to. And it is a couple's disease mm -hmm. and it impacts the couple mm -hmm. if they're in a relationship, of course. But so I think it's recognising it impacts on both in different ways and they've got a new whole journey to uh, approach. And as you've said, it's a working together to work out what you want to go and where you want to go and how you want to do it. And everyone is different and there's no perfect um, solution. And as George has said, there's no perfect, no perfect. situation. Mm -hmm. What works for the couple is okay for the couple. But did you want to add anything there, Elise? No, it's just really uh, confirming and conferring with both of, both of you that it really is about that open communication and taking the risk to be a little bit vulnerable because actually through that vulnerability and sharing that vulnerability, you, you deepen a connection. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we've really strayed into the next topic, haven't we? How to raise incontinence with a partner to be and normalise the conversation. I think we might start um, with you, Gay, on this one. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it's a really, you know, with um, people that I see, incontinence is a, is a side effect of, of prostate cancer and a prostatectomy. So um, my thing is that most couples going in will be aware that incontinence is going to mm -hmm. happen. And so incontinence sometimes often isn't the biggest discussion in the bedroom, it's discussion with with other men and, and other people. But um, there, is a, there is a bit of negotiation before the actual operation happens. But then I'm, people, assume that it will only be a, a little bit of incontinence, a little bit of a dribble, and sometimes it can be complete incontinence with very wet mm. pads, six, eight pads a day, and it's very difficult to feel sexual and to mm. feel um, clean as well. Mm. Men will often say to me they don't feel clean, but it's, it is that vulnerability, vulnerability again, mm. is actually discussing, talking about where you're at and... Um, how you're going to navigate this. It's hard though, it's hard to talk about sex, it's hard to talk about being wet. Mm. They're not topics yep. that come up at the pub. They're not no. topics that come up at dinner parties very often. So it's, it's hard no. to discuss this. Mm. George, um, you, you're a sex educator, what's your thoughts? Well, I, absolutely. I think it's really hard, um, especially for men, because you know we're schooled in this idea that sex requires an erection. 
Mm. And and I think, you know, that's a huge misnomer because um, there's so many other opportunities of, of, of activities that people can enjoy. But I think that conversation has to happen with mm. um, men that their partners can enjoy them doing other things. There's oral sex and there's toys and there's fingers mm-hmm. and there's all kinds of things that people can do like hand holding and talking dirty to one another, all these things. But sometimes men don't think that. They think that mm-hmm. those are those are second, third, fourth on the list, but I better have an erection when it comes down to it. And so I think couples have to renegotiate that perhaps, you know, we can explore, as someone said, this is a, this is a new opportunity to explore what can our sex lives look like now? What's the new normal? What's the new things that we can explore that you know we can put on the table? Yeah. Terrific. And Anya, would you like to um, add your thoughts here? Yeah, absolutely. For me, I was in a little bit of a unique situation because my incontinence resulted from a reconstructive surgery, but I also had a reconstruction of my reproductive system. So it was always a conversation that I had to bring up upfront in the relationship because things were different for me. So I always knew that I could talk about incontinence even on the first date um, and that if they ran away, then they just weren't the right person for me. And I think that it comes back to, you know, renegotiating what intimacy means, being prepared for all situations and just going with the flow. If you're with someone that cares about you, I don't really feel like this is something that should matter. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Alan, your thoughts? Yeah, there's a... There's a lot to cover, but also I think, as George said, there are more than one ways to skin a cat and men have to change their thinking process about how they're going to be intimate with their partner. It's not just penetrative sex. And I think it's relearning how to be a partner again. It's like Mm -hmm. maybe starting all over again if they're prepared to do that. And part of that is dealing with the incontinent part, I guess. Okay, okay, we're going to have sex and we do want penetration. All right, well, I need to go to the toilet and make sure I don't leak or have a bowel movement, being aware that having a full bowel can also impact on your bladder. So make sure you get all that cleaned away and make it part of the routine. It's um, all of a sudden just not wanting to have sex, but okay, I'm going to want, we're going to be doing something in half an hour. Okay, let's make sure I'm all okay. I don't have to worry about that. Maybe having in a, a towel on the bed or a proper pad, just to cover all those uh, little things that can happen. So there's less chance of being embarrassed, I guess, by that all, but it becomes part of the routine and both are able to get out of that hurdle. So once you get over that hurdle, it becomes less a problem, but getting yourself prepared at the same time can make a big difference. And if you don't talk about it, it'll sit rent-free in your brain and it will mm-hmm. upset the relationship. Thank you. And Elise, would you like to add to that? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, what's been said here has really been so useful. I I thought what might be useful is to kind of just talk about sometimes what happens in our head when we're thinking about raising a conversation with someone. And even though it's normalised in our mind, we, we, we used it, the anxiety can sometimes actually make you avoid either having the conversation or actually become avoidant of having sex altogether. And especially if it's a new partnership or a, one that you're wanting to go on, kind of like what Anya was talking about there, going on that first date, how do I bring that conversation up? Do I bring that conversation up? And just to kind of point out, you know, like our head wants to jump ahead into that catastrophic land and are really sort of catastrophizing how that's going to play out and how you're going to be rejected. And as Anya kind of pointed out, you know, really, actually you're better off knowing and finding a way to kind of be yourself and be okay with who you, what, what's happening with you because this is actually what's going to go forward and you want a relationship where you can be vulnerable with somebody. Okay. Well, we've given that a, a fair um, bit of attention. Is, is, is there any, any of the panellists want to say anything more on, on that particular heading of raising incontinence with a new partner? I might add that, you know, I think it's important maybe if you practice that ahead of time, Mm. you know, if if it's not something that you're, you know, used to, as someone has said, you know, we don't talk about sex in our culture. And so it it can be just challenging to talk about sex in general. So actually practicing that with somebody and saying, you know, these are the things I want to talk about with a potential partner. And it could start off with these are the things I like to do. These are the things I enjoy happening while we are in some sort of physically intimate moment. And having that discussion and making that just, again, part of the routine of you're meeting someone, you're talking, and you get to a certain point, and you know that, hey, I'm going to share with them 
these are the activities that I enjoy. And while I'm at it, I might talk about these other activities that are limiting for me. And so it just becomes a part of the negotiation and it just becomes natural for you. Yeah. Thank you. I think I think practice is important. Yeah. Practice yes. is important yeah. indeed. Okay, well, you've all done really, really well. You, you've um, explained well to your partners and you've normalised the conversation, <laughs> but how are you going to maintain that intimacy? I'll start with you, Anya. I think what has really been said by the panel as a whole is it's about having that conversation. And I think that it is about constantly reaffirming your body image that your incontinence does not take away from your self-worth. You are still as much of a person. You're still, even if you can't get intimate in certain ways, there are still many other ways. Um, yeah. So a bit of variety. Okay. Do you want to add to that, Alan? Look, yeah, I think what Anya, not think, that Anya has touched on the best way to approach it, but also being prepared to step out your comfort zone and because most couples have been doing the same thing for so long, <clears throat> it's pushed them out of their comfort zone. So seeking professional help can be useful in different areas to get how, how to re-establish that communication as well. We're not all communicators. We might be able to talk, but we're not able to how to communicate around intimacy, mm -hmm. how to talk about how do we want to have sexual penetration or whatever it might be. But incontinence is sitting there, so how do we deal about this? And as it's been explained, we've got to get out of our heads and look for some simple ways to approach this. And the intimacy can be done in different ways as it's been explained. It could be just holding hands or cuddling naked, not having any expectations around that. And that can then lead to something else. But finding out what works for the couple is important because often couples have been doing the same thing as been explained. So it's time to reinvent, reinvent yourself. It's time to adapt and make changes as well. You want to add to that, um, Alex? Yeah, I think take the word intimacy and in a relationship and expand it because intimacy is not just sexual and satisfaction in a relationship comes from emotional intimacy. It comes from feeling like you have things to share. It becomes, you know, it's, it's everything. So that maintenance of intimacy is about, that's where we really work at our relationship, you know, expanding, deepening creating that connection that goes deeper than just sexual intimacy. Yeah. Thank you. And Gay, would you like to add to that conversation? I provide my couples with a lot of strategies about maintaining mm. their intimacy or, or even to commence intimacy. Mm. And one, one uh, strategy is to write down a whole list of things that you would do for intimacy or for in sex sexual, your sexual experience, and then individually go away and write down which of these things you'd be happy to engage mm. in and which you wouldn't and why not, and then get together as a couple and see which of those strategies or which of those activities join up together. So mm. you might want to hold hands, you might want to go to the movies, you might want to have massage, you might want to have mm. penetrative sex. Mm. So you pick a couple of those things off the list and work with those first and mm -hmm. see how that progresses. And one of the things that I've found really popular is an activity where couples just massage each other without touching um, any genitals and building back trust. If there hasn't been any sexual activity for a couple of years, um, then building back trust in that relationship sometimes with established relationships or and, and just touching someone else's body. And I also say in the middle of the day, walk up to one another and have a passionate kiss with no um, agenda. It's fantastic for everyone. It's a great <laughs> feeling. And yeah. to have a 30 second cuddle just in the yeah. middle of the day yeah. and, and feel connected together and, and do those things outside of the bedroom mm -hmm. where you can start to engage um, together and, and build back trust with one another. So they're just a couple of strategies mm -hmm. to continue on with um, intimacy. Does anyone else want to add to that? Oh, I look, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Thanks, Lack Alan. Of expectations. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Again, it's yeah, having a hug regularly. Maybe it could be first thing in the morning you get up and you kiss each other good morning or give each other a hug. And also being aware of your partner's feelings at different times. And I can just say that we actually walk around the nude at home, but the curtains are closed. But that's something we use to maintain that interest yeah. and that desire. And, and uh, I think you've got to look at different ways of appreciating each other's body without the embarrassment, yeah. etc. So it's a good way of finding new ways to get around it 
and, be, and if it doesn't work for you, you move on to the next strategy that Gay's mm. talked about. Mm. It, if it, not everything's going to work for everybody. It's fine with what you want to do, but I think, well, not think, it is important that you talk about this, otherwise it's just going to sit there and mm. rub the relationship the wrong way. Okay, thank you. Um, we're doing quite well for time, and I'd like to remind people who are listening in mm. that you can send in your questions. Um, we can deal with those at the end of the webinar. So please, um, and on any of these topics or anything extra that you want added, please feel free to let us know so we can address them with you. So trust. <coughs> We've heard a lot about trust mm -hmm. this evening. How do you manage feelings of embarrassment, fear and frustration? I think we might send that one over to Elise. Well, yeah, I think... First of all, acknowledging that we have feelings of embarrassment, fear and frustration, and that they actually are normal feelings. It would be odd if we didn't have these feelings. And kind of that showing that compassion to self is really what I think is really important. Then it's kind of having a look at some techniques around how we can actually manage the arousal within ourselves in terms of our system getting nervous, anxious, fearful, and learning some techniques around how to coach ourselves, how to relax, how to use mindfulness, for example, and preparation where possible. And, you know, we were talking a bit, a bit earlier actually around that idea of practice and practice builds confidence. And when we, when we are sort of feeling that we're going to be embarrassed, actually practicing, allowing ourselves to develop a different way of looking at ourselves does help with those feelings and managing them. Yeah. And... Gay, what are your thoughts along these lines? I think to just acknowledge that they're going to be there, those mm -hmm. feelings of embarrassment and, and fear and frustration. And because they're there once and you manage it once, it doesn't mean it's not going yeah. to come back. And there's going to be fear trying something new. There's going to be frustration when there is something that as a couple or individually you try and it doesn't work. It's um, acknowledging that those things will be there, but those fear and embarrassment and frustration can be there in everyday life with yeah. couples that are um, able to function without incontinence and are, are without erectile dysfunction. It's just being aware that they, they will be there. And I think to seek out someone to talk to, whether it be um, your partner, whether it be a health professional, whether it be a... Um, a, a friend or a support group to get to get there and just talk it out sometimes can be very beneficial and to get strategies from someone else as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Anya, would you like to um, build on those ideas? Yeah, absolutely. I think as someone that experiences incontinence, of course, there are there is a fear of something happening when you're in a really intimate setting. There can be frustration, I think, especially from your partner if you're having an episode of incontinence or you don't feel confident enough to engage in intimacy because of that incontinence at any given time. Um, and I think it's it comes back to those open conversations for me mm. that you're really discussing these things with your partner. And I think that that fear and that embarrassment is something that you, you can work through with a partner, yes, but I think it's also about your own self-talk your own self-worth, how you're affirming yourself, how you've incorporated that incontinence into your identity, that it's something that just exists rather than it's something that's horrible and going to ruin everything. Um, so I think it's really about how you frame it for yourself. Um, and I think that confidence that you project um, influences your partner. So if you're more confident about it and you think that it isn't something to be embarrassed about, I've found that the partner often reciprocates that feeling. Thank you. And um, George, would you like to continue with this? Sure, yes, absolutely. I think it's it's uh, just to add to the conversation, you know, giving yourself permission that it doesn't have to be all or nothing, that you can negotiate with your partner something in between. And so I think having that on the table that, you know what, I might not want to do a, B, and C, but I'm open to doing X, Y, Z and being able to share that with your partner. I think also 
all of us tend to get a little bit lazy when it comes to our relationships and we kind of take advantage yeah. of them sometimes. And keeping in mind that you can't just turn it on and off like a light switch. And you know, if this is something that you are mindful and thoughtful about and you are sprinkling those moments like being nude in your house with your partner and going up and doing a passionate kiss, you can sprinkle those moments throughout the day, throughout the week, so that when you do wanna have the big enchilada, whatever that looks like to you, that it, you've had a, you have a pathway there because you've been building this all along, and I can't under um, I can't uh, advise, say enough about you know having someone on kind of a retainer, uh, an expert, a sexual health expert, that if you and your partner do run into some challenges, mm -hmm. that you you feel comfortable seeking advice, just like other people would seek advice around a variety of things that they value. And if you value your intimate sexual relationship with your partner, don't be hesitant to, to seek that outside advice and have someone on retainer. Mm. Thank you, Elise. Oh, um, well, I think I've already spoke about feelings of embarrassment and fear and frustration, but I will actually just add to, to what George has said there in terms of just that ability to have a partnership with somebody. And it doesn't, it, whoever that may be, you know, whether you've got actually a partnership with somebody who can talk to you about the practical aspects of continence, such as yourself, Gay, you know, like where you, where you are actually getting that sort of practical advice or whether it's that emotional aspect where you're going to be talking to somebody around how to actually be vulnerable or whether it's learning some skills that actually help put you back into that sense of control and, and looking at that level of, of, and I really loved how Anya sort of put it, putting back into that framework, changing that framework of how you view yourself so you don't lose your sense of self when you actually, when something changes, yeah. Alan? Yes, it's an embarrassment one, it's a, a big one for men, I guess, and I think if I, my own experiences. I was a little bit paranoid when I was wearing the pull-ups and the pads for a, a number of months and I could have sworn mm. I could smell myself, I could mm. smell the urine, yet the pads had a built-in deodorised, but I didn't think they were working. Mm. And then I thought, well, if I can smell it, my partner yeah. can, my wife can smell it, or when we go for coffee, someone else can smell it. So it was getting a bit frustration that I couldn't control what was going on. I was changing the pads regularly. And my wife, Fiona, would say, look, you're showering, I cannot smell it, it's working okay. Mm. So it's getting over that fear that someone else is going to smell you when really it's not happening. So it becomes very internalised. And I think for men, we're fixers. I think George mentioned this earlier. We're fixers and we want a solution right now. And actually, you've got to look at other ways of getting around this. Maybe you change your pads more regularly. Go back to see your uh, continence mm. physio. Talk to the prostate cancer su uh, support people as well, the nurse, sorry, Guy. Okay? It's right. getting over that fear of someone else must be able to smell me. So, and the fear of I'm gonna leak with my orgasm, whichever way it might be. But I think if one can separate oneself from the issue and your own body, as Anya has talked about, it's okay, this is happening, but it's not all of who I am. This is just a part mm. of my body that's just not functioning correctly at the moment. And you know, they can step back and deal with it. And otherwise you tend to come part of the problem at the same time, which can make it be more difficult to deal with it as well. I think that's a very key aspect, that ability to step back and mm. really see that I, this is not all of me. Yeah. This is just yeah. something that I, I have. It's not who I am. No. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a question. I've never been intimate with anyone. I'm now in my 20s due to my incontinence. Do you have any suggestions? Would you like to begin this one, George? Wow. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, maybe just, um, it, it's kind of a broad question here. Suggestions, you know, um, at 20, you know, are there um, friends and people that you can connect with that can um, um, introduce you to people? There's all kinds of dating apps. And so looking at what works for you, whether that's going to a pub to meet somebody or whether that's going to through a, an app, um, you know, I'd want to know a little bit more 
from that person? Um, what do they particularly see as their own hurdles around meeting someone? And recognizing that, you know, starting out with just a conversation and, and allowing yourself mm-hmm. just that permission to, to meet somebody and, to, and, and not feel pressured that it has to lead to a physical or sexual experience and be okay with limiting what that looks like. If you only want that to be hand-holding or cuddling, or you just want to do some, um, you know, maybe just physical like massage for you to recognize that you can put limits on this, on the first experience that you're having with someone. But um, I think I would want to ask the person, what do they see as their barriers? Is it actually meeting someone? Are they concerned um, what the first experience is going to look like and how they're going to manage that anxiety? Um, And maybe even just, you know, reaching out to talk to someone professionally uh, might be the best route to start Mm -hmm. with. Right. And Elise, do you think yeah. that a lot of people um, who experience incontinence avoid intimacy? Yes, and in fact, there's a lot of research out there that has kind of confirmed that as being one of the key things that does tend to happen and that people do avoid intimacy due to feeling embarrassed or feeling some level of, of self-esteem that's changed. And I think the other problem is, is that our head wants to jump ahead, you know, especially if we're meeting somebody or you're thinking about meeting somebody new or dating, we're jumping ahead already to the relationship already established, whereas actually there's a number of steps to even get there. And again, a relationship is more than just sexual penetration. There's a lot that can be explored in terms of developing intimacy over time with somebody. Would you like to give us your perspective, Guy? I think Elise has done incredibly well with, <laughs> with that discussion. It's been a long time since I was 20. Yeah. I, can tell you. Um, I think that it's important to, as George said, is about you're the person in control. Mm. So you allow yourself to go to what level you want to go to. So not expecting that it, it will be um, sexual penetration. It will be... Um, you know, there, there will be a curiosity and, and it's, um, I know, the idea of getting it ticked off as something that's been done and mm. no longer a, a, a virgin and, and wanting that experience to also share with your friends to say, well, look, I've, I've, I've been there. But to actually say, I'll take control of this, I think is really mm. important and to gauge where you want to go. And I do think at that point, probably having some professional help to role play the mm. situation, to at different strategies on if the relationship goes this way or that way, how am I going to manage with mm. my fear or angst with it all? Yeah. Mm. Anna, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think so. I'm still in my early 20s and it has only, I was going to say, it's only been a few years that I've been sexually active, to be really honest with you. And I'm just reflecting on my experience because I sort of went down that route but with other challenges sexually as well. And back to what I was saying right at the beginning, I thought that sex was some perfect magical thing. Yeah. Um, but when I actually had sex, I realized that it's messy. There's sweat there, <laughs> bodies moving around. Like, I don't think that you realize that when you are a virgin. Um, and I think that even if incontinence comes into play, there's so much other stuff that you have to deal with that you don't <laughs> need to worry about it. I would recommend just go for it. Obviously, set your limits, work up to it. Um, but it's nothing to be afraid of. I don't think everybody has glamorous sexual experiences. I think everyone's had yeah. a bad sexual experience at some time. Yeah. Could I jump in there? Because actually, yes. I, I want to just say, you've got to remember that in, when you're having sex with somebody, there's two people involved. Well, usually two people involved. <laughs> and I think the thing is, this is that each person's actually got their own stuff that they're concerned about and anxious about and bringing to the party. And we just got to go back into that whole idea. We would not reject somebody because they were feeling anxious or nervous or, you know, that's, we're, not, we're not likely to do that. So why would somebody do that to us? So it's kind of just remembering there's always two people with their own stuff going on too. Yeah. And Alan, Stephanie um, has specifically mentioned you in her communication. So glad Alan brought up the continent physio. <laughs> there can be a great deal of control yeah. regained through supervised yeah. pelvic floor muscle training. Do you want to um, respond in any way to Stephanie Allen? Look, it is a great mm-hmm. resource and uh, I certainly mention to men when I'm talking, if they ring me up individually and it gets mentioned at the support groups and it's just this backstop that 
if you're not doing too well, you need to reach out. They are there for you. Mm. If there's one in, not in the area, there's also a, a tele nurse thing happening. But they are the backstop for men if they don't feel comfortable talking about their issues in a group, and that's okay. Not everyone wants to go to a group, mm. but the prostate cancer there is there. It can make a big difference to getting over those hurdles, the mindset you might have, uh, the difficulties you're facing, and they can be seen individually or, you know, I'm sure Gay sees couples as well. So it's important that they utilise those services. You're not on your own. And often men, when they're diagnosed, think they're the only man that's got prostate cancer. Well, now there's another, in Victoria, another 4,000 of you who have been diagnosed. So support group, but there is individual support for you around certain, Victor well, around Australia at least anyway, the prostate cancer nurses are a great resource. So there's no charge from them, utilise them and work your way through what's going on for you. Thank you, Alan. Does anyone else want to add to uh, Stephanie's point? Yes, I would. Um, so the, the men that, that I see, I support them um, with what to expect from um, their prostate cancer and to expect continence. And I recommend for every man that I see to go and see continence physio um, before their surgery to practice pelvic floor exercises. And then um, they have a follow-up visit a couple of weeks after their catheter's removed and then continuing follow-up visits. Um, I think that the uh, pelvic floor exercises that um, continence physios uh, teach men and women as well, mm -hmm. I, but I, I, you know, sorry I'm speaking mainly about men, but that's my experience at the moment or my role at the moment, but certainly continence physios are an integral part of helping with continence mm -hmm. and continence nurses as well because they will look at... Um, yourself as a whole, what you're doing, what you're eating, what you're drinking, how you can manage um, exercises, what you can do to, to help with your um, continence. And even um, there has been research saying that continence physios um, will also help with um, sexuality as well mm. and, and the toning of the sexual, um, sexual muscles and all for, for men and women. So certainly that's something to um, consider with continence. Um, and improving, and outcomes look good when people go and um, and seek additional help. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And um, this um, question is directed to the consumers mainly. Um, do you have any practical tips to recommend for steps that you personally have? No, I won't say you personally, but anyone <laughs> has taken to prevent accidents during or with sex. And Alan's already mentioned a few. Do you want to expand on that, Alan? Look, um, <clears throat> I think for men nowadays, they're more informed about things that can happen. But I guess just going back on my own experience, I was learning on the job, as the saying goes. So I wasn't expecting to be leaking when I was orgasming or I wasn't expecting to be leaking when I stood up. So I certainly learned and found out there was different little exercises I could do using the continence physio to reduce that happening. I guess for men... Uh, if they're uh, with a partner and they are having penetrative sex and they are still leaking in orgasm, then wear a condom. Yeah. That's the quick, That's the first thing to do. And uh, put an absorbent pad down just to make sure whether you do or don't. It gives you that sense of support and control to a degree. Mm -hmm. But I will say in general for most men, as they move along the journey of recovery, that it needs, well, generally starts to happen less and less. And as you gain more control, as Gay has said about seeing the cotton's physio, then there's more control happening with the pelvic floor, so there's less chance of that happening. However, uh, I've discovered when I use injections so I can have an erection, if I haven't been to the toilet, once I've injected, I start to have that erection, I'll squirt. I'll have a bit of a leak. So I've realised I need to make sure I empty my bowel and bladder and then go through that routine. So it's all these little things you learn along the way, but not every man will have that. But just being aware it could happen. So you take steps to prevent it so you won't be frustrated, you won't be embarrassed, and you're taking steps to get uh, over those little hurdles each time. And I guess from my perspective, we make a bit of a game of it at home as well. Oh, I better make sure I don't have a leak. Yep, you better make sure that doesn't happen. You know, we, we bring some lightness to the uh, mm. thing. And as George said, it's got to be fun. It is fun and it's pleasurable. And just not make it too serious. You know, get outside of your heads. Lighten things up the best way you can. 
I think Anya might have more to say about yeah. that. Yeah, Anya, over to you. Um, I definitely agree um, with what Alan said. I think that if you do have urinary continence, see if you can empty your bladder. If you have bowel continence, see if you can empty your bowel. In my case, I'm in, in quite a unique situation and I actually do bowel flushes. So I would like to make sure that I've had a bowel flush before because that reduces the likelihood. But in general, and I think especially what Alan and I touched on before, a lot of the time you have no control and that's the entire point mm -hmm. that you can do whatever preparation techniques and it doesn't guarantee that you're not going to have a leak or not going to have an accident. Um, so for me, my preparation, I guess, is more mental preparation and obviously trying to stay out of my head in the moment, but knowing, okay, I've had the conversations with my partner. If it happens, it is okay. Um, and it's more that preparation in terms of the conversation and that emotional intimacy with your partner that I think is most effective for me. Emotional intimacy. Mm. That's a great tip. Thank mm. you. Mm. Um, how to cope with sudden change to continence? For example, prostate surgery, childbirth, etc. I think we might start off with Alan <laughs> on this one. <laughs> well, certainly prostate surgery will interfere with your incontinence overnight. But there is a qualifier, as some men and gays probably come across and who are content pretty soon after the surgery and we don't know why. It's a flip of the coin. So as long as men are aware that they will be incontinent and they're aware there are various products out there to deal with that, there are pull-ups, there's pads, there's a whole range of, it's a whole industry of, in, of continence products. So the first thing is to be aware you're going to be leaking and secondly, it will or possibly interfere when you want to be intimate with your partner. So it's important that you're aware of what the products you can obtain, but also I think Annie and I have to discuss again, getting out of your head, as Eloise has said, you need to get out of your head about this and look at ways mm. you can bring some sense of control for yourself in the process of looking after that continent. And just being aware that it will get better as long as you don't focus on your exercises. But again, the qualifier, there are some men who unfortunately at the end of 12 months aren't any better, and there is another step they can take. Let's go back, talk to your prostate cancer nurse, talk to your physio, and go back to your urologist and see what can be done next mm -hmm. rather than putting it up for two or three years. And I've heard of men who still, you know, two, three years after, still with pads, and I go, why? You know, there are ways of getting around this. You're doing yourself a disservice. So there are ways you could be helped, and it's important you seek that information out. Thank you. And Gay? I think that's right, Alan. I think people are, if um, there, there is this belief that their surgeon has, has done the operation mm. or delivered their baby and they don't want to go back and actually say there's something wrong, something's not working properly. So I think to go back to the consultant or who you've been with and say, is there anything that you can do to help me with this incontinence that I'm experiencing? And there could be a surgical avenue to go down and there's lots of um, developments with surgical, um, reconstructive surgical um, interventions to improve um, incontinence and with men we see a lot of sling procedures or artificial urinary sphincters that will go in to help with the um, incontinence. But there's also the practical side mm -hmm. of the continence physio, the continence nurses and they will also, there is a program where you can get um, funding for pads and for products that actually you use for incontinence. So there are a lot of people out there that, who don't even know that. Mm. And um, so go to the go to the professionals, ask for advice, seek for advice, and they're there to help you. They're there. Mm. They're aware that these things happen, and it's just about you going and and speaking to to the professionals that will be able to put you in the right direction for some improvement in in mm. outcomes. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Elise. Yeah, I think what's probably important here is to realise that any sudden change takes adjustment. Yes. And we tend to expect ourselves just to sometimes cope. Um, and actually, we need to give ourselves time to come to terms with what it is that we're dealing with and to seek the appropriate assistance for that. I mean, things at places like the Continence Foundation of Australia tend to make that all available where you do have a central place where you can actually find out information. Um, it's important in terms of becoming aware of what you've always thought it of as normal versus now seeing it as not normal and how that might suddenly change your way that you look at, at things. 
Um, I, I do actually, I have to say that there sometimes is a, especially within women and childbirth, there does seem to be kind of a, an understanding out there that, oh, this is something that's likely to happen and it's almost like it's normal. And as somebody pointed out to me earlier today, that's not normal, actually. It's, it's not something that you actually have to live with. It's something that you can actually get some assistance with. But to expect that we're going to go through some emotional adjustment to changes that are happening in our life. Mm. Okay, and George, do you want to add anything to this particular question? I, I think everyone's added some really great points. I think the only thing I might um, um, put into the conversation is, you know, recognizing that if you're going to have a healthy, long-term sex life, it is going to change. It's going mm. to change. The sex life that you have in your 20s is not the sex life that you have in your 60s. And that is normal. And to recognize that we can enjoy our physical um, relationships with our partner, our partners, but it is going to look different as we age for a variety of reasons. And I think that idea that we want to hold on to that perfection, the way it was, the way it looked, mm -hmm. that sets us up, I think, to be really disappointed. And so when change does happen, e even sudden changes, to give ourselves a little bit of permission to just recognize that our bodies are going to change throughout our life and our abilities um, in the bedroom are going to change. And I think if we can approach that change with that understanding, it can be a little bit easier. Thank you. And, and Mark wants to know, does leakage during intercourse create other health problems? Who'd like to tackle that? Well, yeah. I, I, I think they could. <laughs> leakage won't cause, um, you know, it, it's dependent on the, the um, amount of leakage, but I think they're, they call it climacteria when there is leakage um, during um, orgasm. And often it's only a small amount. And as Alan said, go empty empty uh, your bladder beforehand. If you need to reduce your fluid intake beforehand, um, that's that's also good. Um, and I think just that that small amount of urine that that um, often is is leaked into um, the the vagina um, will will come out as as semen does. It's not it's not a big issue. And one of my strategies that I say to to my part to my partners, sorry, not my partners, <laughs> to my um, patients and uh, is to actually think about having sex in a shower, mm. in a bath, mm. in a pool, in the ocean, somewhere where mm. um, there's a lot of water and yeah. there's water going in and out of, of all cavities <laughs> and um, it's, it's, it's okay and that initially may help with that feeling of, of fluid being um, extra fluid being around and um, gives an opportunity for the person who is leaking to feel, to not experience or be aware of it because sometimes it's certainly not the partner, it's the individual that is, is wet that has more angst about it mm. and so if they're not aware of it, it might be a good opportunity to, mm. to be in a, an environment more where it, it makes you less aware. Yeah. And Kath agrees with you entirely. <laughs> she says, an idea I sometimes suggest, mm. sex in the shower, mm. can That's also right. be a great idea or just share, showering together. Mm. Perfect. Mm. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Did you want to add anything, Alan? I think Gay's covered pretty much what I was going to say. I, I, I agree. It's, you've just got to find other ways of dealing with it. And, and what Gay's talked about is just, it's a little bit of fluid. And actually, when it first happened for me, I was certainly embarrassed by it. But uh, once I got over that experience, I also realised that it actually felt like, because it was part of the orgasm, mm. I felt like I was ejaculating, but of course I wasn't. It's the pelvic floor and everything that's going on with the nerves. So well, it's going to sound weird. You could sort of enjoy it, yes, but yeah, realise yeah. at the same time it's just a bit of leakage and I need to do something different so this won't happen again. And it means maybe I haven't been doing my pelvic floor. I haven't talked about me. I haven't been doing my pelvic floor exercise enough again. And I didn't go to the toilet before we started all this. So it can be just a little tap on the shoulder. You just adjust. You're adapting each time. The more you adapt, mm. the better it will be. But everything that Gay has talked about is ways of getting around it. Is there anyone else who'd like to add something for this particular issue? All done. All right. Um, our next heading is practical issues. Well, frankly, I think we've been extraordinarily practical <laughs> all through this <laughs> webinar. So, um, 
Um, do you want to add anything, Gay? Look, there's, there are um, many things available if people want to go looking um, and if they want to talk to uh, a health professional and particularly people that have got experience with intimacy or sexual sexuality or um, uh, sexual health. I, th- I think to help people navigate in that space and to have the comfort of asking this is what I want, this is what I'd like to look at, what, how can this accommodate me, how can this accommodate us? Um, we don't always know the answers when we're sitting at home mm. and, and going through our own head. But if we seek support out there and, and ask others that are, uh, are dealing with this all the time, it's amazing what support will be there and what comfort you will find from actually talking to people who have explored this for many other people. So I think that's important to to seek help with people that are experts. As well as consumer forums, so connecting with other people who have gone through it, much like something like this, where it just really does kind of, you don't feel so alone Mm. and you can have a good laugh a lot of the time and you can also share some amazing resources and things that you found out and tips and ideas, much like has happened, yeah. And I would say... That's where most yeah. of the strategies that I've picked up yeah, to, to tell um, men and their, mm. their partners has come from mm. other other couples or other men yeah. telling me what's worked for them, where they've gone to seek help, and mm. um, it's been very beneficial for mm. other men that I can share mm. it with. Mm. Mm. And uh, Anya, would you like to add some practical issues? Yes. Um, So I think the practical issues are quite obvious with incontinence and how to cope with that, like it's been discussed. I really think peer support is a really wonderful thing. And that's what helped me a lot. Of course, there is so much help from health professionals. um, But for someone like me, I didn't have um, any cure or any you know, treatment, not even too much management. So it was really about being able to, you know, have those conversations with people who understand. And I can genuinely say that some of my closest friends from all over the world have experienced incontinence and that it's created such a beautiful sense of vulnerability where you're actually able to share that with someone else um, and have that mutual understanding. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, And I was getting so carried away by listening to all of your fascinating Answers that time has actually <laughs> slipped away almost, but um, um, we should have we should have somewhere oh, here for the you. Last... But I'm not very good with this gadget. We've noticed that. Yes, we <laughs> have noticed keep, that. Keep, keep going. Yeah, yeah. There, there you go. go. That's it. Yes, there, there we go. go. <laughs> um, there are places that you can go and get help. Um, nurse continent specialists have been mentioned tonight. Pelvic floor physiotherapists. And we had questions from um, participants about that. You good old pharmacists, psychologists, and don't forget the National Continence Helpline, 1-800-33-0066 and Lifeline, 131114. And if this webinar has raised any concerns for you or someone you know, please contact Lifeline. 131114, or you can go to www.lifeline.org.au. So it really just remains for me now to say thank you very, very much to our expert panellists, our consumers who are also experts. Um, These are not easy issues to talk about publicly, and, of course, that in itself creates stigma and further problems. So um, I'd like to congratulate the Continence Foundation of Mm. Australia on the work that it does and for giving us an opportunity to speak about subjects that are usually talked about as euphemisms like pooey-pooeys or um, I think I saw a red red somewhere that um, Nana says, oh, the cat's done (laughs) pooey-poos on the floor. And the kid says, Grandma, are you talking about the shit? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't claim that's entirely original. Thank you all very much indeed and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.